Good morning. Good morning, those who are here right now, 10.30, those who are watching us, 6 o'clock today, here in Memphis and all over the world. Yes, through the media we can go all over the world and thank God for this opportunity. We come here maybe in a time that we're trying to make sense of life, and I have to tell you that sense and meaning will not come by exploring COVID and all this, what's involved or, or checking the numbers. Meaning in life and significance will come when we do just like Paul, when he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. So this is what we want today, to know more of Jesus, celebrate him, worship him, enjoy the fellowship that we have. And I hope you enjoy it, that you also participate enthusiastically in our service for the glory of Christ. So if you are a first time visitor, a guest, we're so honored to have you here. I wish I could give you a hug. We can't, but in our hearts, you know, you are welcome. You are embraced by this community. I hope that you feel this as a home, a place for you as well as we worship together. So let us come to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for bringing us into your presence as we worship together collectively this morning. It is so wonderful, Lord, to really focus on you in a world full of turbulence, full of adversities, full of concerns, full of bad news. It's so good to come together to worship you and hear your good news again and be reminded of your love and your care. We thank you, God, for bringing us together to worship you this morning. And this is what we want to do, Lord, just to present to you not only our voices or our tithes, our offerings, but our very own life, Lord. We want to bring it to you once again and renew our lives and our dedication to you. This is a special day for us as a congregation as we will vote on a new uh, student minister, we pray that you will guide us in this process at the end of this service. Uh, it's a time also in which we are going to hear about the search for a senior pastor, Lord. We are on, in your hands, Lord, and I pray and I really pray that you will guide us as a congregation. For those of us, Lord, that came this morning perhaps with a burden in their hearts, Lord, we pray, God, that somehow your Holy Spirit will bring comfort and peace and hope because we know and we trust that you can do it. You give meaning to our lives, and it's so good to have you on our sides. Lord, I pray also for our church members who maybe are suffering, uh, are uh, in distress. We remember David Jennings uh, grieving the loss of his wife, Nancy, this weekend. God, we pray that your peace will surround him. We pray for Jim Ray as he fights this cancer, God, that you will give him also strength and hope and healing. We rejoice with Mary Richard that she was able to go home after a few days in rehab. Pray for her, for her strength to get, for her to get the strength back. Those of our friends, our family members who are in rehab, may your love touch each one of, each one of them. Again, Lord, we worship you this morning. We thank you. And we offer this service to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let us sing to the Lord, Jim. When I was a student at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, Terry York was a student there in the music department, in the worship department, and he wrote the words to this song, Worthy of Worship. I want you to stand with me as we sing our hearts out to our Lord now. Join me in standing and singing. He truly is worthy of our worship. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of glad songs we can sing. Worship. 
is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Holy Word, the Bible. Sing with me, please. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto When I feel afraid, when I feel afraid, still you're there right beside me. Nothing to be you, you are near. Please be near me to the end. not forget I will not forget my heart forever is wandering Jesus be my guide and hold me to your side I will love you to the end Why seated. Barb, come and lead us. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody this morning. Um, I'm Barbara Ward. I've been chairman of the Student Ministry Search Committee. And on behalf of the Student Ministry Search Committee, I want to introduce you to our student minister candidate, Nathan Chester. Nathan currently lives in Piperton, Tennessee. He went to high school at Briarcrest Christian School. In May of 2020, he received a Bachelor of Arts degree with a double major in Missions and Ministry and Journalism from Union University. This fall, Nathan is starting classes at Mid-America for his Master's in Divinity. He's currently a member of Crossroads Baptist Church. He served as a mission team leader for two summers on mission trips to Uganda. He was a student minister intern at First Baptist Church in Lexington, Tennessee, and he's been a discipleship leader in several area churches. Nathan enjoys writing and regularly writes sports, ministry, and cultural articles for several publications. He also enjoys sports, especially basketball, with his greatest interest being people. He has a very outgoing personality, and his love for Christ is contagious. Um, please welcome Nathan. He's going to share his testimony with us. Thank you, Miss Barbara. Um, 
Like Ms. Barbara said, my name is Nathan Chesser, and I'm very excited to be here today. And I promise I wasn't going to use too much of my limited time to brag on Ms. Barbara, but she is one of the best communicators that I've ever dealt with in my life, and she has been extremely helpful to me throughout this process. I also want to thank her and the rest of the search committee and Mr. Orville Cotton and the rest of the personnel committee for working with me up until this day. So in this limited time that I have here today, I want to share a little bit of my story and my testimony and why why I think God has led me here to Trinity Baptist to be the student minister. So my parents, Steve and Alice, are over there. They uh, raised me in a very Christian home. They raised me in godly godliness and a passion for the word, and they raised me in the church, and I thank them every single day for that. But I have never been one to take anything at face value, and fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, that applied to my faith. So I grew up in Sunday school. I grew up in the church. I grew up with a knowledge of who Jesus was and what it was that he did for us. But I don't think I truly knew that in my heart until a later time in my life. But I went through the motions. I went to Sunday school. I went to church, just like many other kids my age. And I had a head knowledge of who Jesus was. Now, when I went to ECS back in elementary school, we had kindergarten friends once you got into the fifth grade. And my kindergarten friend thought I was probably a little bit more intelligent than I actually am because when we got each other gifts throughout the year, the first gift he gave me was a science experiment manual, and the second one was a book called 1001 Questions and Answers. And I remember thinking, wow, this kid thinks I'm a big nerd or something like that. But I don't think I deserve that, but anyway, there, the following summer after that year, I was bored at my house one day, so I started flipping through the book that he gave me, 1001 Questions and Answers, and I came to the religion section on it. And I started reading about Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, other worldviews, other ways of thinking, and for the first time in my life, doubt started to creep into my mind because, again, I was never one to take anything at face value. I was never one to truly buy into something unless I had examined it for myself. So I was nominally a Christian, but when I was confronted with other worldviews, other religions, and other ways of thinking, it made me want to investigate. So throughout my middle school years and even going into high school, I began to study other ways of thinking. I began to study different religions like Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and it got to a point going into high school where I grew tired of searching. I was still a Christian. I still called myself a Christian. I still went to church with my parents. I still went to a Christian school. I still had head knowledge of who Jesus was, but I was so tired of investigating and searching constantly to the point where I wasn't even fully sure if I knew what the truth was anymore until I came across a verse that I came across in one of my classes in Briarcrest High School when I was a sophomore and it was Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28 and it changed my world. Jesus said, come to me all of you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. And that made so much sense to me because I was tired of searching. I was tired of trying to figure out what truth is when the truth had been plainly staring me in the face my entire life. And that person who is the truth, who is the word, who is God, was saying, come to me and I will give you the rest that you're looking for. Jesus is the only way to find peace. He is the only way to the Father. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and he is the only answer to the problems that afflict our soul, that afflict our person, and inflict our society, because you can never find true justice without the one who justifies. You can't find true peace without the Prince of Peace. And every single worldview, every single other religion provides some way of you trying to reach God on your own, trying to reach God through your own efforts, through your own knowledge, or whatever it is that you're gifted at, when in Christianity, which isn't a religion, it's the religion, it's God saying, you would have never been able to reach me on your own, but because I love you, I'm going to reach you through Jesus. I'm going to meet you halfway. And that's how much God loves us. And it was through that peace that I was able to find after hearing that verse, the rest and peace that is found in the truth of what Christ has done for each of us on the cross, that he loved us so much that he died in our place just for the chance to have a relationship with us. And because he was God, guys, it's the truth that it wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross, but it was his love for you and me that did that. How can you not be moved by that love? How could I not be moved by that love? 
And it was through experiences that I had in high school after that, after I came to a true saving faith in Jesus Christ, um, mentors that I had at Briarcrest that pushed me into ministry, and then later experiences that I had in Uganda, among other places, that realized God wants me to work with you. God has placed this calling on my life. He has placed this desire in my heart to disciple young people because, guys, I don't know the exact statistic off the top of my head, but somewhere between 85 to 90 percent of kids who grow up in the church are not consistent attenders of church after they go to college or leave their household. That's a very frightening statistic to hear, and that's a trend that I want to help buck no matter which way that I can. I want to be a witness. I want to disciple youth and help them in their walks with Christ and to see them grow in their faith so they can help lead the next generation, lead the next generation of people to Jesus and be the salt and light of the earth, a city on a hill that can't be hidden. That's my heart, guys. I want to see the youth of this church and then the youth of Memphis as a whole come to know Jesus, and I want to generate growth here in that way to see more young people who are willing to stand up for their faith and stand up for Christ and create a change in our society and culture. Thank you.
Amen, indeed. Thank you, choir, musicians, for a beautiful word. We come before the throne of our Lord Jesus just as we are. And it's so good to see you this morning. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you to those of you who join us uh, in a later broadcast of this service. We want to especially welcome this morning the Chester family, Steve and Alice, so glad to have you with us today. And uh, we will certainly join you in praying that God will use Nathan in a mighty way in the ministry that he has chosen for him. I listened to Nathan, and I feel like I should confess to you that I am somewhat envious of a young man who can be so articulate and so spontaneous while wearing a mask. <laughs> I will strive for both without the mask. This morning I invite your attention to the book of Psalms. 150 songs of encouragement, 150 songs of praise. We are between sermon series here at Trinity. We finished the unexpected series last week. We will begin a new series. It has been my practice while I've been with you to uh, take a little pause between series and just have a word perhaps of encouragement for the congregation uh, while we are transitioning from one train of thought to the other. And so today we look to Psalm 42 and 43. Now the reason both Psalms are included is because in the original text, Psalm 42 and 43 were combined into one Psalm. Some later editor divided the Psalms. You will see the similarities I'm going to read for our text, Psalm 42, and our message this morning is entitled, <clears throat> Refreshment for Discouraging Days. When you read the Psalms, don't forget the attribution or the superscription. They tell us much about the intent of the Psalm. As you are able, you may join me for uh, in standing for the reading of God's Word as we hear the word of the psalmist. This psalm is to the choir master, a masculine of the sons of Korah. This is a song. A masculine means it is an instructional song. It is meant to teach us something. And it's written by someone simply identified as a son of Korah. The sons of Korah were the musicians in the temple. It was their ministry to write and sing the songs of the Lord. And here is the text. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God, with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar, Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to my God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? 
Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. This is indeed God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. Father, will you speak to us in clear terms? Will you find us receptive? Will you encourage us by your spirit? We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, as of today, I have had the privilege of being your interim pastor for eight months. <laughs> Some of you are saying it seems a lot. No, 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 stop that. Yeah, I'm reminded of the guy who goes, no, that, that was nice, thank you. But some of you are saying in your hearts, well, it sure seemed a lot longer than that to me. <laughs> uh, the occasion of being your interim pastor for eight months brings to mind a dream I had several weeks ago. And it was a, it was a strange dream, and uh, I, I haven't told you about it because I'm not sure how you'll take it. But this, this is the dream. I dreamed one night uh, that I was no longer the interim pastor of Trinity Baptist Church. You had called a pastor, and he had been here, I think, for some time. Now, I don't know how long it was because Jim was still the minister of music. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know exactly what the time frame was. But uh, I happened to be visiting Trinity for some reason, and the new pastor was in place. And as I entered the building, I picked up a copy of the history of Trinity Baptist Church. I don't even know if there is such a thing, but in my dream, I had one. And I began to read it. And as we are prone to do, I looked for the section that talked about me. <laughs> and here's roughly what the Trinity history said about Mike Day. Mike Day served as interim pastor for several months following the retirement of Dr. Richard Hips. Under his leadership, the church ceased holding public worship for about three months. <laughs> Under his leadership, tithes and offerings declined by about 45%. Under his leadership, attendance decreased by about 50%. While Day was pastor, there seemed to be a growing distance between church members. <laughs> they rarely hugged or shook hands. It was as if there was a heaviness in the spirit of the church. Those who did come to church preferred to conceal their identity <laughs> behind masks. <laughs> Needless to say, I woke from the dream a bit on the discouraged side. The truth is, these are uncertain and discouraging days, even in the life of the church. And as we walk through what we have collectively walked through in the first six and a half months of 2020, <laughs> by the way, do you remember the sermon I preached on the last day of 2019? a vision for 2020. I missed it. <laughs> and 
and you did too. And in the midst of missing it, we sometimes can become discouraged. Even as God's people, we, we truly wonder how it can happen. After all, we are God's people. But nevertheless, it does happen, and there are times when God's people are spiritually discouraged or spiritually depressed. There are times even when we may feel that God has forgotten us, and there are times that we may feel that we may never get back on track with him again. This is precisely the condition of the psalmist who wrote Psalm 42 and 43. You hear it in the repeated refrain of the psalm. You will notice as you read through these two psalms together that Psalm 42, 5 and 42, 11 and 43, 5 are all the exact same words. And it's these words. Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. You hear the distress and you hear the hope. So uh, this morning and at this point in our journey together, I, I think it, it's appropriate for us to consider the fact that there is truth in the fact we could be somewhat discouraged, we could be somewhat disheartened, we do not know what is going to happen next in our world and in our church, and so we need refreshment for days that could be discouraging. And the psalmist helps us in two ways. He helps us by pointing out some of the things that contribute to this sense of discouragement and by pointing to some things that will help us cure this discouragement. So first of all, the contributors. What is it that occurs in our lives and in the life of the church that might indeed contribute to an attitude of discouragement or depression? Well, the, the psalmist quickly points out four things that brought him to that point. The first was absence from the temple. Absence from the temple. Well, we don't know who the psalmist was, but as we look at Psalm 42, verses 1 to 2, we discover the main thing that was bothering him. Hear those words again. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? You see, what, what was happening, the main thing that was bothering the psalmist is that he is far from Jerusalem and its holy temple. Now, of course, the temple in the thought of this psalmist would be the place where God resides. Therefore, this psalmist, having been removed from the temple, is cut off from God. And he said, my soul longs for fellowship with God like a deer would thirst for water. But he asked the important question, when may I appear before you? You see, to this point, this psalmist's life had been consumed by the fact that he was a songwriter. He would render and recite the songs that were sung in the temple. So all of his identity was wrapped up in his service and in his commitment to God. And now the Babylonians have come and taken him captive and begun to remove him from his comfort zone, his land, and his ministry. And he feels like he is cut off from God, all because he is absent from the temple. 
Psalm 42, 6 picks up the theme, and he says, my soul is cast down within me. I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Well, what in the world does that mean? If this particular psalmist had been taken into captivity by the Babylonians, he would be in a progression that is moving east toward Babylon. The region that he identifies as Jordan and Hermon and Mount Mazar is the last place from which he would have been able to look back and see the mountains of his home. It would have been the place that marked for him Perhaps the rest of my life will be spent in absence from the temple, from the place where God has called me to serve, from the church. Could it be that in our case, a contributor to any spiritual discouragement or depression we might sense is simply an absence from the temple? an absence from our connection with our church, an absence from our connection with the worship that we long to offer to God. How many times did you hear in the first few months of coronavirus threats, we just need to get back to church? We just need to get back to church. The absence from worship can certainly lead to our discouragement. The psalmist also notes that there's a second thing, not only absence from the temple and worship, but attacks from the enemy. In this distant land, the psalmist is surrounded by those who are taunting him. Look at at, uh, chapter 42. Verse 3, my tears have been my food while they say to me, they say to me, that is, my enemies say to me, where is your God? Literally, it means where is your God now? Where is your God when you need him? In 42.10, he says he is emotionally crushed by the chiding of those who say again, where is your God now? And then you move over into chapter 43, and he says in 43.1, these are attacks from unscrupulous enemies. They are malicious, and their treatment is hurtful. The psalmist is simply saying, my circumstances are overwhelming to me, and what complicates them is that those who have me captive taunt me day and night and ask me, where is your God now? Why is he not doing something? If God is the God that you say he is, why has he not eradicated coronavirus? If God is as powerful as you say he is, why are we in the midst? that we are in. You've heard it, and I've heard it, from the enemies of all that is spiritual. And as we hear it, as we hear non-believers almost seem to delight in what appears to be God's absence, those attacks and that mistreatment upon the community of faith can indeed dishearten and discourage us. Absence from worship, attacks from the enemy. Are you discouraged yet? Let me try again. How about this one? Attachment to a more fulfilling past. Think that one through. Attachment to a more fulfilling past. Here's what he says in verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. He is troubled 
by his memories of better days. Instead of remembering God's past acts of encouragement, the psalmist becomes wistful in his lament. The Hebrew word here is a very simple Hebrew word. It simply is a reference to the good old days. That's what he's remembering. He's saying, oh man, it, it was so different now than it is now. It was so different then than it is now. How I wish we could go back to the good old days. When we sang from the 1956 Baptist hymnal. <laughs> you remember the good old days? Oh, those were the good old days. Weren't they? Well, one thing we learn here is that this is a misuse of memory. God gave us memory for a reason, but if we use our memory to remember how good it used to be as a comparison to how we see it now, then we are misusing the memory that he has given us. C.S. Lewis says it this way, the work of the Spirit unfolds in the present, not in the past. The work of the Spirit unfolds in the present, not in the past. And then as only C.S. Lewis could, he further complicates the matter by saying, God did work in the past, but when God worked in the past, the past was the present. God did work in the past, but when God worked in the past, the past was the present. And so don't spend your time with an attachment to how good it used to be or how fulfilling it once was. God is working now in his spirit in the present. And to dwell on how it used to be will be discouraging and defeating. And finally, the psalmist adds one more contributor. Not only absence from worship, not only the attacks of the enemy that seem to never stop, not only our occasional attachment to how things used to be and how we long for them to be that way again, but the sense of abandonment by the one who can help is certainly a contributor. And the psalmist painfully cries out to God in verse 9, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why have you forsaken me? It's a reminder of the cry from the cross of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forgotten me. It is not unusual at all for those of us who are depressed or discouraged to feel forsaken by everyone, even by God. You recall the story of Elijah as it unfolds in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. Elijah, who had had great success against the prophets of Baal under the leadership of God, everything that Elijah had said was going to happen, happened as precisely as God had ordered it. And Isaiah should have been having a great victory celebration, but he got a telegram from Jezebel who said, by tomorrow your life will be like the life of the 450 that you just killed. In other words, I'm coming for you. And Elijah departed and ran in a sense of discouragement and despair. And when God found him, God asked him a question. What are you doing here, Elijah? And do you remember his answer? Lord, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. In other words, I've done everything you asked me to do, exactly how you asked me to do it, and now I'm by myself. I, even I only, 
am left. And he said it three times. He sensed that God had forsaken him. Well, there's no doubt that in times of discouragement, we can certainly feel that nobody cares about our situation and nobody who could help us really comes along to help us. Well, uh, one of the perils of preaching about discouragement is often that if people weren't discouraged when they walked into the room, they will be when you get done with them. (laughs) We can't leave it here. We can't leave it in this place. There are certainly those things that contribute to our spiritual discouragement, but there are certainly also those things that constitute a cure for spiritual discouragement. There are three suggestions that this psalmist makes into our lives through the refrain that is repeated three times in this particular psalm. I'm going to read it again for you. Here's the refrain. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So what do we find there that leads us to a cure for this spiritual disheartenment that might take over our lives. Three suggestions. Number one, the psalmist suggests that we preach to ourselves. That we preach to ourselves. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his classic book, Spiritual Depression, asked the question, have you realized that most of the unhappiness in your life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Have you realized that most of the unhappiness in your spiritual life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Now, he explains it this way. When we are discouraged, the emotions do all of the talking, and they dictate to the heart and the mind how we should respond and how we should feel. Lloyd-Jones suggests that for the believer, that trend should be reversed. And that during times of despair, we don't listen to our emotions. Rather, we let what is written deep in our hearts by the love of Christ and what is in our mind through our experience with Him, we let that speak to the rest of who we are. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it this way, and I quote, you must take yourself in hand You must address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. You must say to your soul, why are you cast down? What business have you to be disheartened? You must turn on yourself, upbraid yourself, condemn yourself, exhort yourself, and say to yourself, hope in God instead of muttering in some depressed and unhappy way, end quote. Preach to ourselves. So you say, that, so that's the way out? <laughs> that's the way out of discouragement? Just give myself a, a little pep talk? Let's go win one for the gipper? Is that all it takes? Well, no, what he's suggesting is that we preach to ourselves a gospel message. And Pastor John Piper suggests that when we need to preach to ourselves a gospel message, Romans 8, 31 to 37 is a great text. I'll read part of it. This is what we should preach to ourselves when we are discouraged. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation 
or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are what? More than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither life nor death nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, not even coronavirus, will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Amen and amen. What a beautiful text for us to take in hand as we take our own lives in hand and preach to ourselves. So preach to ourselves. Secondly, in periods of depression, we must challenge ourselves. And the statement of challenge out of the refrain is simply this, put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. In the midst of discouragement, challenge yourself to do that which must be done. When everything else is breaking apart, the psalmist says, trust God. Put your hope in a sovereign God. The operative word there is sovereign. If he is sovereign, if he is indeed ruler of all, if he is indeed in control, then he is working for my good and his glory even when I am in a period of discouragement. He is working for my good and his glory even if I am despondent. You pick this up from the psalmist in verses 7 and 8 of this psalm where he says, deep calls to deep, at the roar of your waterfalls. Now, what, what does he say next? All of your breakers and your waves have gone over me. In other words, my soul is just flooded. I feel like I'm going to drown. But what is the great statement in the middle of all of that? Whose breakers are these? Whose waves are these? Who controls the water, it is God Almighty, the sovereign God. So even though I sense that I am about to drown, the drowning, the feeling, the sensing is in the hands of the sovereign God. And he will work to my good and to his glory. So no matter what has you despondent, no matter what has disheartened you, whatever you do, hope in God and challenge yourself to do so. Preach to ourselves, challenge ourselves, and finally, the psalmist says it this way, remind ourselves. Remind ourselves of a great certainty. It's the last phrase in the refrain, for I shall again praise him. For I shall again praise him. Some translations render, I will yet praise him. I will again praise him. The discouragement, the disheartenment, the disillusionment, the despair in my life is for a season. There will be a day, says the psalmist, there will be a day, says God, when I will praise him again. Now, it may not be today. And the psalmist says, as a matter of fact, I, I really wonder where he is today. I am disconnected and out of touch. So it may not be today, but I stand on his promise that he has not changed. And his purposes for my life have not changed. He has led me to victories in the past. He will do the same again. And when I need to be reminded, he will turn me toward the front of his book. And he will remind me of people like Joseph and Moses and Joshua and David and many, many others 
who can testify there was a time in my life when I felt as though the Spirit of God had departed, but lo and behold, He was always there, and I will praise Him again. And if the Bible is not text enough for you at that point, perhaps Bill Gaither is. Hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. Weeping only lasts for the night. Hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. The darkest hour means dawn is just in sight. Remind ourselves, no matter where we are today, we shall again praise Him. Does this kind of medicine work? It appears to me that it does. Now, you do more study of these two psalms on your own, but here's what you're going to find. In the first stanza, verses 1 through 4, the psalmist remembers and is depressed. And then he sings the refrain. And in the next stanza, verses 6 through 9, the psalmist remembers sweetly what God has done. And he says at the end of that, he is my rock. And then he sings the refrain. And after he sings the refrain the second time, he says in chapter 43, Vindicate me, O God, defend my cause from the deceitful and the unjust man, for you are the God in whom I take refuge. You see, for the psalmist, he moved from asking, Where are you, God? to affirming, I know you are a rock. As a matter of fact, third stanza, you are my stronghold and I will praise you again. My prayer is that we at Trinity would make the same progression in these days. In the midst of uncertainty and difficulty and challenge and perhaps despair, may we preach to ourselves often, may we challenge ourselves often, but mostly may we remind ourselves that our hope is in God. Regardless of where we are today, we will still praise Him. And so it is highly appropriate that as we hear the um, encouragement to remind ourselves that we come to the Lord's table this morning. Jesus said, every time you come to this place, you are reminding yourself of God's grace. You're reminding yourself of his goodness. You're reminding yourself of the ultimate sacrifice that God made in your behalf. So we invite all of you this morning who are followers of Christ Jesus to join us in this supper, which is a reminder of God's presence and God's goodness. It's a reminder of the reason that today, regardless of where our spirits might be, we do indeed praise him. You remember the night before his crucifixion, Jesus went to the garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed. It's interesting that he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. I am depressed. I am discouraged. Father, if it be your will, let this pass from me. I would like for things to be different. Nevertheless, Not my will, but yours. And as your will is done in my life, I will praise you. And so God's will brought him to the cross. 
where he paid the sacrificial price for our sin. God's will brought him from the tomb where he is raised victoriously and seated at the right hand of the Father. And God's will brings us to the point of remembrance in this supper. I hope as you arrive today, you picked up the elements for the Lord's Supper. I will remind you that there are two coverings for these elements. The first is a cellophane skin that just simply peels back, revealing the wafer that we will use as our communion bread. And then the foil removes to reveal the juice that we will commemorate with. I would ask you, be careful as you're opening those packets, any pressure on the bottom might indeed result in catastrophe. And so on the night that he was crucified, he took bread, regular bread, and he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body broken for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. Scripture says that in the same way he took the cup. And as the apostles chewed and felt the texture of the bread in their mouths, he said in the same way this cup is the New Testament of my blood which was shed for you. As often as you drink it, remember me. Our Father, we thank you for this simple reminder that in the depths of despair and in the depths of loneliness, our Lord Jesus yet lifted up his voice in praise and obedience to you. And it is by his obedience that our sins are forgiven and our lives are healed. And we praise you, Lord, and thank you for this reminder. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Will you stand with me and join in the singing of our commitment hymn this morning? Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful. together. <clears throat> Father, we celebrate uh, your victories and your leadership 
and your guidance. And I pray uh, especially right now for Nathan that he might sense uh, your spirit and your direction in, in a great fashion and that you might indeed, Lord, give him great days of ministry in this place. In the meanwhile, Lord, I pray that you would draw us close, that you would help us to preach to ourselves and challenge ourselves and remind ourselves that you indeed are sovereign, you are in control, that you would allow us, in spite of our circumstances, to praise you every day. Bless now the offerings that we will leave as we depart from this place. We pray that you will multiply them for your ministry and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You are worthy, Father Creator. Same. You are worthy, Father Creator. You are worthy, Savior, Sustainer. You are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and prayer. Have a wonderful week.